Hello and welcome to the Sisters for Fitness Wellness Show. I'm Stephanie Gaines Bryant. We're recognizing Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And our guest today is Melinda Clark. She's the program administrator for the Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault Center for Prince George's Hospital Center, Dimensions Healthcare. Welcome. Thank you, Stephanie, for having me. I'm really looking forward to it. Now, I was doing a little research on the hospital center. The hospital center has been around for quite some time, but the domestic violence uh, sexual assault unit has not been around for a while. Or can you explain what's the difference between the hospital center and the sexual assault unit? Well, Prince George's Hospital Center, many people are well aware that that hospital has been around probably close to 65, maybe 70 years almost. But we actually started the Sexual Assault Center, that component of Prince George's Hospital Center, uh, a little over 30 years ago. Uh, this center is a very comprehensive center. It's a rape crisis unit that responds to victims and survivors of sexual assaults, uh, child sexual abuse, and um, and any other type of violence, sexual or intimate partner violence. Uh, it was mainly designed just for that reason. Forensic exams are taking place at that site, and we also provide uh, very comprehensive services such as free counseling from professional counselors. Uh, we offer uh, training, um, do education and community awareness throughout the community, uh, and we also have a number of other programs and services that we offer our survivors. Now this is for the victims of domestic violence. That's specifically for sexual assault victims, but about five years ago, um, we were uh, very, very uh, fortunate to get a grant that is paying for us to also be a domestic violence-based hospital. We are only one of nine hospitals in the entire state of Maryland that has the um, title of being a domestic violence-based hospital. And what that means, again, we offer comprehensive services. Um, we do crisis counseling. We um, also, <clears throat> because part of the Sexual Assault Center is being open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We are crisis counseling and crisis intervention service. And so now that incorporates domestic violence as well. Do you find that people find it easier to go to a hospital than to go to a crisis center or to call a hotline? Is that a safer place for women or men who are victims or survivors? It is, is it a safer place to go to a hospital opposed to going to another type of center? Um, it really it should be, and that's one of the reasons hospitals have been identified as places where um, the clinicians really need to be prepared for screening and being able to respond to domestic violence victims. Unfortunately, domestic violence, one of the problems is that it's kept silent. People don't want to come forward. Victims don't want to tell their story. And there's a number of reasons behind that. Um, but we do find, <coughs> excuse me, that hospitals do, are able to identify victims a little better simply because they're coming in for other chronic conditions that might have lend to show that this may be a victim. This might be someone who's actually in an abusive situation. And nurses are some of the most likely people to pick up on something like that. So do you specifically train the nurses to be able to identify if a woman, for example, is coming in with a, a, a broken arm as a result of falling down the stairs or as a result of being abused? Yes, yes. One of the reasons why we were given the grant funding is so that we can do that. We train our clinicians, our nurses, doctors, staff to understand that domestic violence victims do have certain types of um, things that they come in for, some chronic conditions. And there's certain persons who are higher risk populations, uh, usually young women uh, between the ages of maybe 15 and 25 years old. Pregnant women are more higher at risk. And so there is usually um, one of those things where our professionals are trained to uh, be looking for those kinds of signs that there might be a victim there. The screening is done specifically so 
that they have a safe place to talk to the person, to the patient, when they come through the emergency department or when they're coming into labor and delivery and letting them be able to ask those questions. Do you feel safe at home? What are some of the things that you're seeing in Prince George's County specifically? What would, um, I guess maybe there's no typical case, but what are you seeing a lot of here in the county? Um, <clears throat> we are seeing a decline in homicides. It's not to say that that's always um, the greatest sign of all, but I mean, we, it's good to know that yes, we have three homicides this year in Prince George's County. Uh, which is a decline from previous years. We, any homicide, in our opinion, is awful. And uh, certainly we want to make sure that the community is educated, um, that we get more information out. What we are seeing is an interest in the community to have that training, um, particularly uh, with our community partners. And we're seeing them work more and more with um, not only us, but even with the faith community. Uh, we're also seeing that, um, that people who are coming in are becoming a little bit more um, open about, yes, I'm a survivor, not just a victim. And so you'll find that people, and particularly in our sexual assault center, um, because rape and sexual assault is also, can also be a form of domestic violence as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. And so we find that some of our survivors become one of our, some of our greatest advocates as well. Once you've identified someone, what avenues do you take? Of course, you can't force someone to get assistance, right. but how do you encourage that person to do something? And that's a great question. It's really one that I would, uh, I think all of us need to know. And first of all, it's not to uh, blame the person. One of the problems I think with, the, with society is that we tend to, um, put the burden on the victim as if there was some reason why this perpetrator or abuser had justification to harm them, whether it was physical harm, emotional harm. Um, and so psychologically already that victim has some low self-esteem. They're feeling as though they're the reason why they're, they're receiving this abuse, maybe even because they even witnessed it as a child. And so they're feeling that's part of the norm, that's normative behavior to them. So we allow them to understand this is not your fault and you do have there are uh, ways to to look through it. Another thing is just listening. A lot of times we have to allow that person to kind of think through what they're going through to try to figure out some of the answers themselves and then give them some um, uh, some options giving them ways to understand how to put together a safety plan um, putting together ways to put aside important papers, financial information, make sure you have a code word, things that will help them in case they really do need to, to make a move very quickly, particularly with their children. We give them resources about housing. Uh, the Family Crisis Center is our um, center here in Prince George's County for victims of domestic violence. Uh, we also allow them to know that there are other community partners around, uh, House of Roof, um, Sante, many other services for counseling so that they know that they have these options and it doesn't cost them anything. But most of all, to let them know that we are here at, this, at the Domestic Violence Sexual Assault Center if they need us. So for the most part, um, once they've been identified, you do lead them to different options because as you just mentioned, there are several options available such as housing. What about for the children mm -hmm. of, of these survivors as well? As we know, it doesn't just affect the person who's a survivor. Yes. It's something that affects the whole family, brothers, sisters, cousins, uncles. It's, it becomes a family affair. Yes, yes. Stephanie, you hit on a huge, huge problem. In a domestic violence household, the children 
are certainly impacted by it. Because they're witnessing violence, they actually become victims themselves. They many times show signs, and statistics have shown this, uh, what we call, you know, the adverse child event. And when these events happen, they can actually be experienced post-traumatic stress disorder later on and even as a child. Um, there's been studies to show that there's been cognitive delays in children who are actually experiencing or witnessing. Even if they didn't receive the abuse, they're witnessing the abuse over and over again. It also trains them on what parenting is like. It trains them on what relationships are supposed to be like. And so they themselves may grow to have uh, dysfunctional uh, social skills. Uh, so many things can impact them. Certainly other statistics show that they have um, lower test scores, things of that nature. There's just so many things that impact the children. You mentioned several places that um, assist you all mm -hmm. in helping uh, the people who are dealing with the domestic violence issues. Have you connected with the faith-based community as far as this is concerned? We have. Actually, our coordinator is Carolyn Mulligan, who is a very, very passionate about this issue. She does many presentations and has been out even today, uh, to, because this is Domestic Violence Awareness Month, out talking to the faith community and providing presentations. Because the faith community, we found, has uh, sometimes not been uh, equipped to provide that type of response that is needed. And even to a point where um, the belief systems, the things that we are taught in churches, in temples, mosques, we might find might even be the barriers for um, victims of domestic violence to be able to find um, a way to get free of this oppressive uh, situation. Uh, so it's important for the members of the faith leaders particularly to understand their roles, particularly in uh, referring to professional organizations that are equipped to handle those situations, to understand and be sensitive to the importance of uh, knowing that um, your belief in faith certainly is not negated, but do understand the importance of being able to recognize that um, abusive behavior is, is just not acceptable. I had a situation about a year ago. I um, teach yoga. That's one of the mm -hmm. things I do. One of my students came in. She was extremely upset. She was mm -hmm. part of a, a church group, a prayer group. Mm -hmm. And she said that one of her prayer partners had been murdered as a result of domestic violence. Mm -hmm. It was something that had been going on for a while. And she was encouraged by her minister to try to make the marriage work, mm -hmm. even though she was in a very, very critical situation. So she did what she was told to do, um, did what she had learned yeah. as well to do as a child, is to, to stick with it. Mm -hmm. And sticking with it, caused her death. Wow. So, and, and of course, there's so many instances where the faith community was successful in helping someone. Right. But I guess one of the problems is, I guess, getting beyond someone's belief system um, to help them become safe, to, to, to keep them, their children safe, mm -hmm. to keep themselves safe. Yes. So I guess, I, I guess that's an issue too. And I know how if you're dealing, I'm sure you're dealing with a diverse population of people from mm -hmm. African-Americans to Latinos to whites, but I know how important the faith-based community is in the African-American community. And I, I just want to put it out there that there is help available. Yes, yes. And I appreciate you bringing that out because it is an important, the, the faith community our churches are so important because many times victims will go to their pastor before they will go to anyone else. Um, I do applaud our state's attorney, Angela Also Brooks, who did champion a series of training for the faith community and for clergy so that they would be able to recognize their responsibility to reach out to professionals when you have victims of domestic violence in your congregation. Do you find that 
you have people who um, come in several times before they actually get help? People you see over and over again. I think most of the people who would, that would happen with would be at some of the services like you would find at House of Ruth because most of the time when they come to the hospital, they're coming in to be treated for some type of physical condition. And once we treat them um, with our medical uh, staff and then we do our consult through the Domestic Violence Sexual Assault Center and provide them services there, um, usually we may refer them on to some long-term type of uh, counseling services. I can tell you I used to be a victim advocate in the center before this position. And one of the um, cases I had, I did have to go to court with a victim who was, um, certainly she was being abused uh, physically as well as sexually. Uh, so we went to uh, get her protective order. She was married. Her husband, um, her belief system was that she should stay with her husband. And so we got the protective order and she stayed with her family who was very supportive of her. But unfortunately, she made the decision she wanted to go back to her husband uh, because she felt that that was her duty to him. Um, and it was very, uh, it was a big eye opener for me. And that's when I began to do a little more research and I found that um, it is hard many women will go back over and over again. It's not unusual. It takes more than one time sometimes for someone to leave that situation to feel confident and sure that this is something they need to do. There are other reasons too. One is because of the dependency they have on them. For instance, many times these women have been controlled because domestic violence is about power and control. So there's no finances there. There's no job there. Maybe they need some way to be able to continue to care for their children and they just really don't see a way out. And so they may find themselves making that harsh de decision of going back into an abusive situation over and over again. How do you partner with law enforcement in the community? Well, we have a wonderful relationship with Sheriff Melvin High, who is the sheriff of Prince George's County, and he's very passionate about this issue. Um, as a matter of fact, he's donating purple lights throughout the month of um, October in honor of Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Um, we work together, we really do. One of their roles is of course to serve the protective orders and peace orders when someone has requested one from the commissioner or judge. Um, they also will provide support to a victim if they need accompaniment by an officer to go to the house and get their belongings or to have someone um, escorted out. The deputies will be there to support victims in those cases. And whenever needed, I've called on them, our unit has called on them, and they've been more than happy to even go out and do community education. So they'll go out to churches, nonprofits, um, anything that we need to help help the community become more aware of this issue and they've been very helpful to us. You know a lot of police officers say that one of the most dangerous calls you can go out on is a domestic violence call because they say you never know what to expect. Yes, yes. So I applaud their work in that area. Absolutely, absolutely. It's a very volatile situation. One of the things that is done um, through our unit as well as through the law enforcement is called a lethality assessment. A lethality assessment is really to determine just how uh, significant this, this situation might be. And lethality can be based on a number of things, how many times the person has been uh, in this type of situation, you know, back and forth be, with injuries. Does the abuser have a weapon? Does the person abuse drugs or alcohol? Do they have some kind of mental health or behavioral uh, problem? Those are things that increase the lethality of the situation. And so they are, are trained in that. Um, and in some cases, when they find the lethality assessment is extremely high, they can take measures beyond what even the
the person who has made the call, let's say they go to the home, if they find that the person um, and the lethality assessment is extremely high, the person has a gun, then they can actually make um, some decisions right there on the spot, even beyond what the person who's being abused has decided to do. You mentioned earlier um, going to court mm -hmm. with some of uh, the survivors. How has the court system worked with you or how do you work with survivors when it comes to dealing with the court system, which can sometimes really be a long, um, frightening process? Yeah, it, it, it can be, but really the process is, um, well, in terms of getting protective orders, peace orders, that's a very straightforward process. The um, person that's being abused, and I say women most of the time because yes, most of the time they are women, but we, I, I need to also say that women aren't the only ones that are abused. Uh, men can be abused. Um, we also need to understand too that there are persons also at risk are, are um, in our um, uh, LGBT uh, population, it's, it's really getting much higher now. And so uh, I would say it could be anybody. Going to court, they go to the judge, they go to the commissioner and they say, I need a protective order. They present the case of why. Because you're really making a charge against someone and saying that I feel unsafe. I need, I need distance from this person. Protect me from that person entering into my space within uh, 500 feet or so. And so they're giving a temporary order if it's, it's deemed appropriate. Usually the judge will give them that temporary order, which is only for one week, but they have to reappear a week later. And then that's when they have to face the, um, the, the abuser. And that's very difficult for I'm anyone. Sure. It really and truly is. I mean, we, we simply say, oh, you have to make sure you keep yourself safe. It's easy for us to say that and people to say that. But honestly, to face that person, it's very challenging, and that's why advocates are there to be there to support them, and that's why the counseling is so important to provide them that um, emotional support and and help them to be able to process all these things, process their own fears and doubts, and if they're able to go through the the second hearing, which is the week later, they are and the judge agrees, they will be granted a, what is called a permanent order, and that can be up to a year, a year and a half or so. Um, now that's one aspect of it. Then you have the other aspects where there has actually been some form of assault or abuse, and law enforcement probably would be better suited to explain that, but domestic violence itself is not a charge that you bring against someone. It's the actual act or crime, you know, some form of assault, you know, with a weapon or that, you know, so it can be a, on different levels, but again, the person does have to go to court for that. If, um, as we wrap up the show this afternoon, if there's someone listening who is in a situation and they're looking to make a step, mm -hmm. what would your best recommendation be? And, and I know sometimes for some people, making some baby steps um, will help you get to that ultimate goal. I found it really interesting when you were saying, make a checklist Mm -hmm. of things you need to do, where certain papers are, um, stashing away a certain amount of money. What would your best recommendation to be to someone who's listening who's in that situation? Well, my first, my first thing I would tell them is that it's not your fault. Um, there, there is hope and there's help and that I, I know that they may feel afraid to do anything beyond where they are right now, but they can call us for one thing. They could call us, and again, that, that would help them at least to be able to identify what would be the best thing to do. To tell someone to leave right away is not always the best answer, but being able to have someone, a professional, to listen to your situation, to let you talk it out, it, it's, a, it's worth it. It's really worth it. Whether you call our center, House of Ruth, the Crisis Response Center, any number of the counselors there can provide you assistance. 
We also have some literature that's very helpful, and, in, and some of it's even very discreet. We have a shoe card about the size of a business card that folds up that gives you a list of every resource that you would need in those situations, from law enforcement to counseling to finding housing. So it's very comprehensive, and it's discreet enough that you can place it in places where nobody would find it. And as you said earlier in the show, your program is one of the few that the state of Maryland offers. Yes, it is. I, I, you can certainly go to any hospital and they will provide you uh, clinical help. But if you do need that comprehensive support, we're here for you at Prince George's Hospital Center. And it is something that would be an advantage because you don't have to have any money, you just come. And you say the people are specifically trained Yes. to deal with those issues. So in other words, it's good to know that someone is sensitive to what you're going through. They're not asking you questions that offend or embarrass you. They are trained to speak to you in a way that makes you feel at ease with what you're dealing with, with what you're going through, and mm -hmm. that there is someone that you can talk to. Yes, and that's so important, so important. A safe place to go and people who care. Indeed. Thank you so much for joining us. We've been talking to the Program Administrator for the Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault Center for Prince George's Hospital Center. Thank you so much. I Thank you, Stephanie. I hope I see you more than once a year. Okay, I certainly <laughs> hope so. Thank you. Thank you and much success with the program. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Stephanie Gaines Bryant for the Sisters for Fitness Wellness Show. Stay well.